Bobbish. Yeah, welcome to the talk of last people uh, about JavaScript, uh, Rust, Python, and the Holy Grail. Uh, yeah, uh, Lars is consultant with MQ and Monik, and he loves to uh, yeah enjoys programming in and talking about Haskell, Prolog, and Rust. And yeah, let's listen to him and enjoy his talk. Thanks much. Uh, I am well aware that I'm the only thing separating you from your really served dinner, so I will try to speak very quickly and get this over with. Um, the talk is entitled uh, JS Rust Python in the Holy Grail, um, or Holy Graal, and um, the, the painting in the background is entitled uh, Quest for the Holy Grail, um, and that's got nothing to do with the talk except for the fact that I presume that this is also what it looked like when the Graal VM was conceived. Um, there was probably some, probably some horses involved or something. Um, but before I get to the main subject of this talk, which is the Gravia, I would like to take you on the journey all the way back to when Java uh, was um, uh, initially released. So this is a quote from a very funny blog post from James Irie. Uh, James Gosling invents Java. Java is a relatively verbose, garbage collected, class-based, statically typed, single dispatch, object-oriented programming language with single implementation inheritance and multiple interface inheritance. Sun loudly heralds Java's novelty. So this is how James Irie describes this. Programming language from 1996. And this is James Gosling, and this is Sun Microsystems. I'm not sure who's still around. Yes, somebody remembers. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I forgot to bring my Sun Microsystems t-shirt. I only realized this this morning. It's a missed opportunity. But um, anyway, um, yeah, Java actually came, uh, the, the first JVM actually came out in 1994. And it's got that idea that you have bytecode, and then you can run that bytecode uh, on an, so you have to compile to the bytecode once, and then you can run that bytecode wherever a JVM is uh, available. Um, However, for a very long time, Java was the only programming language that actually ran on the JVM. So that was the only compiler that was there. And um, only uh, in 2001 um, were there attempts to bring other programming languages onto the JVM. Um, although the JVM bytecode was not strictly only for Java, it took quite a while for other <coughs> languages to target. Um, JSON and JRuby came out in 2001. Um, I'm not sure if anybody uses those. Um, I think they were used much um, or heavily in the past. But JSON, for example, is still on Python 2.7. So it's basically uh, completely outdated. I'm not sure about JRuby, if there's any recent uh, versions for that. Um, but my impression was that JSON and JRuby were a successful experiment at some time, but probably not as much in use anymore. But still, they demonstrated that you could run not statically typed languages on the JVM. 2003 then uh, was the first version of Groovy. Um, has anyone used Groovy so far? Quite a lot of people. I'm presuming Jenkins plugins. <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's the main use case for Groovy. Groovy actually started out as a specification proposal for the Java language to um, you know, get rid of some of the, type, the static types and make stuff more dynamic put some more syntax sugar in there, but eventually the proposal was dropped and was just developed as its own programming language. Oh, I forgot, it's not just Jenkins, also Gradle configurations, yes, of course. Um, now, 2004, um, as you can see, more languages start appearing in a, uh, in a, with a fast turnaround time. Uh, the first version of Scala was released, um, obviously one of my very favorite languages, and Scala was a language that had even stronger static types than Java. So, all of these, what you've seen before, tried to like remove some of the typing, and Scala actually added some more typing on top. All right, so two years later, 2006, there was the Java 6 release. And Java 6 was notable in that sense that it had this JSR223, also known as scripting API built-in. And the scripting API basically gave you a uniform interface for running arbitrary scripts on your JVM, right? So you could provide, on the one side, library authors could provide scripting languages, and then you could write scripts in those languages, and then 
through this uniform API, you could just like add stuff, uh, add programming language to your Java program. Um, and the question is like, why would you want that? Well, initially this was motivated by having servlets, but wanting to program in PHP. That's literally in the proposal. Like, servlets are cool, but we really want to program our web application on the JVM in PHP. I'm not sure why they put that in the proposal, but that was the motivation. Um, and I, I always thought that like Java and PHP programs are like oil and water. They don't mix, but apparently that was a, uh, I'm not sure, maybe they wanted to get soap to mix that. But um, regardless, <laughs> um, this, their solution was to define this API, and uh, one of the main selling points of that API was that you could exchange objects between the JVM world, the Java world, and those, um, uh, and those other languages. Now, they were talking in this proposal about scripting languages. Um, unfortunately, they didn't really define what they understand as scripting language. And I'm pretty sure they would call like Python, uh, they would, like Python would probably be a part of the definition. Although, if you look at real existing Python code base, for example, you wouldn't really call it a scripting language anymore, right? You can write like big applications, um, not necessarily scripts. Um, but the wording kind of implies that they were talking about untyped languages. That was really the main goal. There were implementations of this JSR for typed languages, but the way it reads kind of suggests that they were really into untyped languages. And the fundamental problem with those is that most calls, most function calls, or other kinds of calls, they require reflection of JVM, but they're really slow. Um, and they sort of said, like, you know, language implementers, um, like if you implement uh, a Python uh, language for this JSR, you just have to live with that, right? So just implement it using reflection, that's fine. All right, so that's 2006. Then for a long time, nothing really happened from a programming language perspective. And then in 2011, the next Java version came out. So as you can see, there was like a five years distance back then between two Java major releases. Now you would have 10 releases in that same time span. Um, and there was another JSR implemented there, number 292. And that one uh, was talking about invoke, or this one was specifying invoke dynamic. So let me explain what the idea behind that was. Um, in 2007, um, let's, still fun at the time, um, created um, an experimental VM they called Da Vinci Machine. And that Da Vinci Machine was basically like a dumping ground for all sorts of different experiments. Uh, for efficiency, for example, they had uh, tail calls implemented there. They wanted to do continuations and stuff. But they also had this uh, thing about dynamic invocation. And before I explain to you what it is, I just want to show you the beauty of one of the slides from Sun Microsystems that introduced this. So you have the Chinese wall here, and you have Duke the mascot somehow attached to Da Vinci flying machine, transferring over the China. I'm not sure what the metaphor here is supposed to be, but <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's just the, what, the, what the slide looked like. Um, so let's talk about this dynamic invocation business. So the problem is scripting languages are really cool, but usually they're duct typed. So when you have X plus Y, you don't really know what the heck X plus Y means, right? Could be any of it. Be one of those things, right? <laughs> no idea, um, right? So it could also return object object. <laughs> so um, if x is an object and y is an array, for example, you, you could be arbitrary stuff, right? You don't know what it is. Um, so the solution is that the JVM provides you with tools to kind of specify your own custom method and operator dispatcher, right? So usually in the JVM, what happens, the, de the default is a virtual call. So you know the name of the method, you know where, in which interface it was defined, you know the types of the arguments, and then the only thing you need to figure out is if someone over had overridden this implementation. So you look at the V table, and it's like two jumps, done. But here, what they want to do is they want to give you full flexibility, like you can implement your own logic, and if you need three jumps, that's fine, just do it. Um, and they wanted to try to make that somehow efficient. That's the motivation behind this. So I've copied some, I've copied this diagram from a research paper about this. The basic idea is that invocations are now two steps, and whenever you do the invocation first, you do both steps, and when you do it again, you may be able to omit the first step. So what are the two, first, the two steps? So the first step is, uh, instead of direct 
directly calling your method. You use this invoke dynamic, and then you call the so-called bootstrap method. And that can be, you know, this is something that the language implementer has to provide. Now this bootstrap method basically says, well, let me figure out what method to actually call now. Let me figure out the call site of this thing that you want to do, like x plus y. And um, basically you can figure out, well, I'm calling this f here or this g or whatever. Uh, and I'm returning, for example, here a constant call site, which means every time you see this invocation, always return g, always call g. Right? So it's like an instruction that's handed back to the JVM. So JVM asks, I have x plus y here, what should I do? And the bootstrap method says, always call g. Right? Um, so the JVM does it for the first time, and then it will actually bind this, or link this, to this call site. So whenever it sees that, it will go straight away to g. So you can skip this bootstrap for the next time, which means it makes it much faster. Right? So every t starting from the second invocation, it will always be efficient by directly going to g. But there's all sorts of bells and whistles. For example, you can tell it to attach some conditions. So you can say, well, actually, it's not a constant call site. It's like a variable call site. And it's g most of the time. But if there's some condition violated, then ask me again or something like that. You can do that. So if it's non-constant, it can also get relinked. And fun fact, these method handles have kind of an interface that allows you to encode an entire Turing machine in it. So <laughs> it has like loop combinators and stuff. So you can say, this method handle um, repeats this other method handle for this method handle time. So this is possible. Um, I'm not sure why you would want that, but uh, I've been told that people have implemented entire program language just in a single method handle. Um, so just to give you an idea how powerful this thing is. And uh, basically what happens is that JVM tries to inline this as far as possible and just make it efficient. All right, so this is cool, but the problem is this is really hard to implement. So let's say um, you're working in your day job and you think, actually, this would be nice to have a domain-specific language for this problem. Um, let me implement an efficient compiler for that. And then next thing you know is you're looking in the JVM language spec and you're figuring out how to help to implement an efficient bootstrap method. Um, that's really not uh, that cool. Um, GraalVM will fix that. But before we get to GraalVM, uh, I have two more stops in the history uh, book. Um, 2014, Java 8 came out with Nathorn. And Nathorn was a, or is still a JavaScript engine. It will be deprecated soon, I think, uh, and removed. And Nathorn used this invoke dynamic. So you could start to efficiently execute JavaScript. Uh, so they used it, it was fine. I'm not sure what other languages also use invoke dynamic. Probably a lot of them. And then finally, 2019, the first version of GraalVM came out. And GraalVM kind of Tried, tries to revolutionize this entire idea of running different languages on the top of the JVM. And um, it's developed uh, by Oracle, and it's got tons of features, and I'm going to focus in this talk about the specific feature that is very nice if you want to implement a programming language. And that feature is called Truffle. So what is Truffle? If you look at their website, this is um, how they describe it. Truffle framework allows you to run programming languages efficiently on Gravia. It simplifies language implementation by automatically deriving high performance code from interpreters. So that sounds kind of intriguing. Like, if you've learned uh, something in like a compiler construction course or some other software engineering course, whatever, um, people will tell you that like writing an interpreter is usually kind of easy. Yeah, if you just have a method that basically looks at all the different cases of your syntax and then like runs this, but it's also kind of slow, right? And what they're talking about here is now automatically deriving high performance code from interpreters. So you can write some slow interpreter code and then you have to do nothing and then GraalVM makes it efficient. That's cool, right? So you can be done much faster with your implementation. Okay, when I first read that, it sounded a little bit like magic and I can assure you it's, it is magic, but I want to try to give you uh, some insights into how this magic actually works under the hood. Okay, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with what currying is. Um, currying basically means that if you have a function that takes two arguments, here you have a function that takes an A and a B and returns a C, what you can do is you can partially apply that function if you already know the A, right? And what you get back is you specify an A, and what you get back is you get back a function 
that only takes one argument, b, and then returns a c. So far, so good. Now, in most programming languages, um, there's some kind of syntax to do that. But what they probably don't do is they won't evaluate anything at this point. It's like basically some kind of pointer in memory. And only when you specify the b, then the entire computation will run. That's the standard case, right? So this is basically a very efficient operation because it does nothing. It only creates like a pointer in memory saying like, oh, in case you read a b, take this a, which I have saved, and that b, and then run the computation. Now, this is partial application. Very careful now. Partial evaluation is the same thing, but it will actually run the stuff that it can. Right? So assuming um, this function can already do something with the A, maybe look up some stuff in a table or whatever, then it will do that. Like it will try to evaluate this binary function as much as possible, leaving you the so-called residue of this function. So the B to C that gets out basically has no traces of the A left anymore. It's evaluated as far as possible. And compilers do that all the time. So we have all sorts of things that compiler, compilers do to an uh, innocent program, like uh, constant folding. I think there was a talk that mentioned this today already. Um, inlining, dead code image, all of that stuff. So all of these are things that can be described as partial evaluation. Right? The compiler will not actually run the full program for you. It will not tell you the entire output that it it can't do that because it works across some input, but it can look at the static structure of a program and try to figure out if there's stuff it can um, optimize away. And um, yeah, that's partial evaluation. And I want to give you a concrete example here, um, and that example would be for loop unrolling. So I can already tell you this is a multiplication function. It's completely stupid. You wouldn't implement it that way, but just like just bear with me for the sake of this example. We have a function f that takes an x and a y and it returns a product of x and y. And how it does that is it creates some kind of accumulator and then it loops from 0 to x and just adds y on top of that. And then we would, for example, call that in Java, we would have maybe a stream of integers and then we map f3y. So we would basically multiply all the values in the stream by 3. So far, so good. Now, a sufficiently smart compiler could now start to optimize this. And um, it would try to perform loop unrolling. Right? So it's going to pull uh, the, the loop and pull as long as the, so that no loop is left. So for example, it would recognize that f is always called with x is equal to 3. So it would generate a specialized version of f where x is set to 3. So you have a, a function left that only gets only takes one argument. And it also knows that the loop is executed three times, so it will just copy the body of the loop three times. And then you get plus, the plus equal y, and so on, three times, and then you get the result there. So no loops left, which is good because the CPU does not have to perform jumps. So in general, this would be a positive performance optimization. Of course, CPUs are much more complicated than that, but let's just assume that this is better in every way. Um, now it could also look at the actual implementation here, what actually goes on under the hood and could, for example, recognize that there's, uh, this is 3 times y. It could do that, and I'm pretty sure that GCC and LLVM, they do all of that. They're actually pretty advanced with their optimizations. And then finally, they could also perform, a compiler could also perform inlining, so there's no residue of the function left, you basically just get this, 3 times y. And um, maybe there's also some weird assembly instruction that does that all in one thing, maybe, I don't know, um, but that's the general idea. Now, this is pretty cool, because compiler can use these techniques to produce much more efficient bytecode. And what the RAVM people said is, well, all of these compiling optimizations, they're really just partial evaluation under the hood, right? So, compiler writers have to do a lot of work to implement optimizations, wouldn't it be better if we just implemented partial evaluation once and for all and then call it a day and go home, right? Then we would have fixed all the compiler optimizations. Of course, reality is not that simple, but that's the, that's the bottom line, what they're trying to achieve. Okay, any questions up until here? 
Good. Um, now let's get back to the initial quote from the website where they claim that you can just write an interpreter and you get high efficient code. Um, let's first talk about um, what a compiler and an interpreter is. A compiler is the thing that transforms the program in two different steps. First step would be to take the source code, apply some transformations, and you get some target code or intermediate code, however you want it, to how you want to call it. And then you, fit, you feed that target code into a runtime. That runtime could be the operating system, it could be, um, it could be the JVM, it could be something else. Uh, and then the runtime also reads the input, like from standard in, and then it fills something like printing stuff on standard out. That's a compiler. And it doesn't really matter uh, what the target code here is, just, like, just assume it's JVM bytecode. An interpreter, on the other hand, collapses that into a single step. So an interpreter directly takes source code and feeds it into the runtime and produces output depending on what input you give it. Um, what the GraalVM people want to do now is you, let's say you invent a cool language like the Bob language. Um, and you want to execute this Bob language, so you write an interpreter. So you write this, you write this runtime. And then what the GraalVM tries to do is give you this automatically, right? So that would be pretty cool. Um, and it turns out that the people um, at Oracle, they weren't the first people to think of this. Um, in fact, there's this paper um, that is called Partial Evaluation of Computation Process in Approach to a Compiler Compiler. And the compiler compiler is basically a thing that gives you a compiler, right? Um, and that is a pretty futuristic thing. Um, and it's called the so, so-called Futamura projection. Um, I, I'm hoping that I'm not violating any copyrights with that slide. <laughs> um, so this paper is quite old. It's from the 80s. And what this professor Futamura basically said is he conjectured that there could be such a thing. So he defined this Futamura projection, what he calls it. And what it basically does is you have source code from the Bob language, and then somehow directly you end up with a compiled program without any compiler involved, right? Um, and then you can run this, and it's as efficient as a compiled program, but there's no compiler involved, right? Does it make sense? Maybe. Um, in the paper, he doesn't really explain how you could do that. Right? It's just conjecturing that. Uh, that could be possible. And it turns out that there's even a complete hierarchy of these projections. So this is the normal thing, like small brain. Uh, you write an interpreter, and the interpreter turns code into a result. OK, cool. The first Futamuro projection is it's a machine that looks at code and an interpreter and gives you an efficient executable. That's basically what the GraalVM does. But Futamuro didn't stop there. So he also conjectured a second Futamura projection, which is taking an entire interpreter without actually looking at the code that it's supposed to interpret and turning that into a compiler. Right? So there's no specific, so you see here, first question is you still need to look at the concrete code that you want to execute. So it's kind of an interpreter specialized to a particular program. Here, you don't even need that. It's just like take the entire interpreter, put it in, get the compiler out. And there's even a third one, so now we're reaching galaxy brain status. <laughs> it's a machine that takes a machine that turns interpreters into compilers and gets back a universal interpreter compiler compiler. <laughs> so that's the third, it's obvious, right? Um, and it turns out there's even a research paper that's just called, is there a fourth Futamura projection? <laughs> um, Wikipedia says no. Uh, I, haven't read the, I haven't read the paper uh, if they come to a different conclusion. Yeah, and the point is that this, this is Futamua. Um, he has a website that looks like you would imagine a Japanese university professor website to look like. Um, and he wrote this paper in the 80s, and um, yeah, he didn't really know how to do this. Uh, it was way too advanced uh, to implement it at the time. Um, now, the people at Oracle, they came and looked at this. Actually, the people who conceived GraalVM weren't at 
Oracle at the time, but Oracle kind of bought this group. Um, they thought, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should put that on the JVM. And they did that, and now we have rainbows and unicorns. Now we just, have, we, now we just need to write an interpreter, and then we get uh, efficient code back, right? Efficient part of code. Wouldn't that be nice? Now, of course, reality is more messy, so it's not all rainbows and unicorns. It's just rainbows, no unicorns, unfortunately. Um, and what they did is they created this Gravium, um, which is kind of like a JVM on steroids. So it's just like a regular JVM. It can run Java bytecode um, as the normal open JDK. And then it can also do a bunch of other stuff. So this is um, a slide I took from the website. The, the basic idea is that you have sort of like an execution platform <laughs> that can take arbitrary languages in and run it on, well, not so arbitrary platform, right? So this path, running Java code on the JVM, that would be the default, right? That would be something that you would usually do on the JVM. But you can also run JavaScript code on the JVM, or you can run Python code on the JVM, and also you can run these things on JVM. I have a slide prepared for that also, but let's first talk about these things. Um, and if you give Oracle a lot of money, you can also run this stuff on Node.js, so you could run Java code on Node.js, or you could also run it as stored procedures in your Oracle DB, right? So <laughs> this is possible. This is possible. You can write Python code that manipulates stuff in your Oracle DB, and not just Python code, but Python code that calls JavaScript code. <laughs> All of this is possible, and it's kind of seamless, because um, they picked the same idea as this Java scripting API, that you have a common understanding of what objects are, and you can pass them around kind of seamlessly. Um, there's an entire object protocol that they have defined, and that object protocol allows you to pass along objects between those different languages. Now, of course, when I say arbitrary input languages, that's not entirely true, because all of these arrows require an implementation, right? So you can't just give it APL code and expect to know what it should do, right? Not even humans can do that. Um, so, <laughs> so of, of course, somebody's got to implement uh, how, how JavaScript works. But what's really cool is that in the free version, the open source version of, of, of GraalVM, a lot of these things work, um, and they test their stuff pretty rigorously. So for example, for the JavaScript code, uh, for the JavaScript interpreter, they run regression tests with like hundreds of NPM packages. And you can be pretty confident that whatever GraalVM or GraalJS does is the same thing with what Node.js does, which is pretty cool because now it's sort of a, a drop-in replacement. And they've implemented even the entire Node.js API, so you can like require FS and do stuff with promises and whatnot. All of this works. Um, right. So on the next slide, I have a, an actual code snippet from the GraalJS implementation. And it's extremely stripped down, but there's still a lot going on. But don't worry, I will take you through this line by line. So if someone here has already implemented an interpreter in an object-oriented language, the way this usually works is you define an interface for um, an abstract syntax tree, like fix some expression or whatever, and then you provide an execute function, and then you implement this interface with all different kinds of expressions that you have. Um, this is a snippet that defines how to multiply two objects in JavaScript. And as we can see, it extends from binary nodes, so we know the execute function needs to take two arguments. And this is abstract, right? So we don't give an implementation here, we just say, well, in JavaScript you can multiply anything with literally everything else. It's just objects, and you get back whatever object. Um, and then, what you do is you just implement all the different cases that are supported. So I've taken some cases here for um, integers and doubles, so just for numbers. Um, there's like hundreds of lines more in there for arrays and objects and whatever. So there's still much more stuff in here. But I think what you can see here is that you can attach these conditions here. Like you can say, this is for two ints. And also, this method should be called when b is larger than zero, because somehow there could be more efficient. I don't know. I'm not a compiler author, but um, they have determined that 
um, if b is greater than zero, they can do something different than when b is not greater than zero. So they have a fallback here. Um, and you can also say stuff like, well, if there's an arithmetic exception, then um, you know, do some other stuff. So you can also put condi other kinds of conditions there. And then for double, apparently the best thing you can do is just run the JVM multiplication operation, like just the double multiply bytecode of JVM. And um, basically what, what they do is, 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 is kind of a supercharged just-in-time compilation. So when you feed some JavaScript code into this interpreter, um, they will basically look at whatever this code does. So it will, it will just interpret it in the first few iterations. And then when they see some patterns, they will replace that by this implementation here. And then they will provide some hooks to rewrite this in case something failed. So that's just regular just-in-time compilation for you. Um, but they were quite smart about this. And this is obviously not the Futamura projection, right? The Futamura projection does not say anything about just-in-time or like statistic looking at branches or whatever. But in practice, they are pretty good. They are pretty close to a real Futamura projection. And when you look at their performance numbers, it's kind of it's kind of exciting because they have not. So the entire GraalVM is not specific to JavaScript or to Ruby or to Python. They just implemented these interpreters with the Truffle API. And then without further ado, they got comparable performance to, for example, Node.js, right? So Node.js is based on the V8 engine, and like hundreds of people have poured hundreds of weeks into optimizing for JavaScript code, right? And they have like a specific virtual machine that's pretty fast now, um, and same goes for, uh, for uh, other browser vendors like for Mozilla and whatever. They have uh, uh, JS engines that are super optimized, and they have now kind of a generic interpreter thingy that um, achieves comparable performance with relatively little um, specific optimization, right? So of course, if you implement a language, you still need to know what the cases are here, but you don't have to write a just-in-time compiler that looks at code and emits x86 bytecode or whatever. You don't have to do that. They do that for you. And I, I, I find that to be pretty exciting, even though they haven't technically implemented the Futamura projection. I mean, it's, it's getting pretty close though. Um, but that's not all, because while efficient code execution is cool, I think there's also a lot of potential in the polyglot aspect of it. So languages may call each other. So you can have, like, in the same stack trace, you can have JavaScript code and Java code and Python and whatever. And I think it's pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> Languages also benefit from the JVM. So for example, um, the Python and the JavaScript interpreters, they usually have only one thread. You can't like, easily parallelize your code. Um, on the other hand, the JVM can easily do that. So it's no problem to run two different JavaScript processes at the same time, or even control threads from within JavaScript. Um, also, you get all the libraries from, like, you get the union of all the libraries of these ecosystems, right? So if you want to run an NPM library, in your Java code, you can just do that, or vice versa. Right, so in my opinion, this is a kind of a green field for more experimentation to figure out what the use cases for this could be. Um, and I, I think the future could be pretty exciting. Now, the stuff I told you before, like about JavaScript and stuff, um, that is, in my opinion, recommended for production usage. So the GraalJS implementation, run it on your machines, it's fine. I will take uh, full ownership if something fails, because it won't. Um, on the other hand, what follows now, for the rest of the like, five minutes I still have, um, is extremely experimental. Do not do that. In, in fact, do the opposite of what I'm telling you right now. <laughs> uh, my employer will not take any responsibility if your servers burn. Like, I, 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 you have been warned, right? This is on record. Um, because what the GraalVM people have done is they thought, hmm, so running scripting languages and, and JavaScript, whatever, is cool, but what if we could run C++ <laughs> on the JVM, right? And they actually went ahead and did it. And
And uh, what they did was they wrote an interpreter for LLVM bitcode. And <laughs> the problem is as follows. If you don't give Oracle money, the execution of LLVM bitcode is unsandboxed. So if you do some pointer arithmetic, your JVM will crash. This is bad. Nobody wants that. Um, so what I thought, what if we take a safe programming language and run that on GraalVM, because then I don't have to give Oracle money in order to not crash my JVM. Um, so I took Rust, and I thought we could compile Rust to LLVM, and then run that on the JVM. And I even created a fancy logo for this. But does anybody recognize the two components of this logo? <laughs> so this is, this is Duke, the Java mascot, and this is, these are the hands from Ferris the Crab which is the Rust logo, and this is like Duke Crab Hands or something. <laughs> um, and I gave the project a name, and the, the project is called Rüstigraben. And uh, Rüstigraben is, again, a pun, I'm sorry. Um, it's a pun on the so-called Rüstigraben. So Rüstigraben is a concept in, in Switzerland. It separates the German and the French-speaking parts of Switzerland. So Graben is like sort of a border, and Rösti is the thing you can eat. And on the German side, you eat the thing, and on the French side, you don't eat the thing. So the Rüstigraben separates these two parts. And uh, the same goes for like LLVM bitcode and the Java world, right? So there's, there's this border between them. And in the interest of like um, mixing things up, I said, let's call this Rüstigraben because now you can eat Rusty on the JVM. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I have actually prepared a demo for this. And this is, uh, again, highly experimental. I want to show you the code that I'm actually executing here. I'm not going to show you all the guts of this. Um, I think this may be a little too large, actually. Let's put a little bit more on here. So I thought Rust is nice, but what it really needs is an enterprise logging framework. Um, and I thought SLF4J, which is the standard logging meta framework for the JVM, would be cool to integrate this. And also, I don't trust the random number generator of Rust, so I want to use the one from Scala. Obviously, right? I mean, I, I just woke up one morning and thought I want to do this. Um, so Rust also has kind of a logging abstraction, and they just implemented that logging app just. Um, I, I banged my head a lot when doing this. Um, and I implemented this with an adapter that actually calls into the JVM. And then I take this entire code, so what it basically does is like it instantiates, it, it, it loads a type, creates an instance. There's still a bit of unsafe going on here. I plan uh, to make that safe in my perturbative free time. Uh, and yeah, and then you call next in, but this, see this beautiful null termination here is extremely <laughs> great. Um, and basically what I'm doing here is I'm generating a random number from <coughs> 0 to 20 exclusive. And then I say the number is whatever. And uh, all of the usual rushed features work, right? So I can allocate strings and I can format the strings and all of that is, is kind of seamless. Um, and in order to add insult to injury, I am building this with SBT, the Scala build tool. And SBT actually calls Cargo, the Rust build tool. <laughs> because obviously, right? Um, so, fingers crossed, it works. Um, it prints Hello World, and it actually prints that the random number is four, as it should. Um, and in, to demonstrate that it's not just hard-coded, I can run it again, and now get 19. So, it actually works. Um, and if I clean this, it should be possible to see that, yeah, you see cargo going on here? There's cargo going on within SBT, and then compiling this to bitcode, and then loading that bitcode into the JVM and running it. So that's the thing that works. I'm not sure why one should do that. <laughs> like, I just thought, like, wouldn't it be neat if this could happen? Um, yeah, and it did happen, and I think that's pretty great although I still don't have a use case. Um, <laughs> if you have a use case, I'm really interested in that. So please, please let me know um, after the talk, which is now. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, are there some questions? An amazing talk, really amazing. Thanks. Aren't you scared that there's like Oracle behind it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair question. 
And yes, Oracle took a lot of heat in the past for how it um, exercised stewardship of the Java platform. And the fact is nobody knows how Oracle will behave in the long term. Um, however, the fact that they open source large parts of the GraalDM is making me very positive about this. And also, one thing I haven't actually mentioned in the talk at all is that um, there's other parts, other features of GraalVM, for example, the ability to generate native images from Java code, like just native binaries. Uh, and people are really getting into this because of microservices. So you don't want like, your, like, whatever stuff you have in the cloud, because you don't want to have high startup times. So people are using GraalVM for this kind of stuff. And actually, parts of these features have now permeated into the official OpenJDK. So I'm kind of, my, my kind of, Personal opinion is that Oracle could see the GraalVM as like an experimental testing ground for stuff that could go into the official JDK, which makes me really positive about the future. Uh, about the future. Of course, if you're pessimistic and think that Oracle is evil, then I don't know what to say. I, I, I have no arguments to to like to give yeah, to disprove that. But it's a, it's an extremely fair question, and um, I would probably suggest like. If you want to implement stuff or like like run hundred millions of business on this, probably like no, look at this for two more years and see where it's uh, then at that point. Some other questions? Uh, but ju just an add-on. The people behind this are from Oracle Research, and they are mostly academics, and they are extremely cool. You should definitely watch their talks. And um, I, I get the impression that. Oracle research is run very differently than Oracle proper. It's like BuzzFeed and BuzzFeed News. They're actually really different. <laughs> BuzzFeed News, they're really good. <laughs> yes? It's slightly late, but I have lots of questions. Maybe I get it wrong, but uh, is it also compiling to Watson so I can run Java code in my browser? Um, Maybe I'm mixing it up. I'm sure. I actually don't know. Uh, you, there's an experimental Watson interpreter for Truffle. But I'm not entirely. I would have to look that up. I'm actually not sure if it can uh, produce. That. Yeah. How would you rate the overall developer ergonomics of using Oracle So you gave the example of compiling to a single binary, which really makes deployment simpler. Yeah. Um, the, are there other aspects where it's easier to use than JVM? I mean, if a GraalVM can sort of function as a drop-in replacement of JVM, right? So um, you can just install it on your machine and never notice it at all. It just works like a regular JVM. Um, but the fact is you only need it if you need the additional features, like uh, native image and um, uh, the truffle. <coughs> Otherwise, I'm not aware what other killer features there might be in. Um, but I mean, there's, it's, it's like a proper superset of the JVM. I think it's a little bit faster. Possibly, yeah. Although much of that just-in-time compilation machinery has also permeated into the proper JVM now. Some other questions? Okay. Everybody's hungry. <laughs> so yeah, thank you again for your great talk.